Hi everybody, my name is Jason Diamond and uh, welcome to our webinar webcast on uh, Bootstrap, the CSS framework from Twitter. Um, we're going to see how to, to use it, um, get a feel for what it has to offer, um, integrate it into an NBC application and uh, see what we can do, do in an hour. If you have questions, go ahead and, and type them in. Um, I'm told by uh, my uh, co-worker at Development Tour that everything is sounding good. Um, so if you're having trouble, um, feel free to type into the comments, or if you have questions, type in the comments, um, and we'll, I'll try to pause every now and then to see uh, what's there and, and um, go through them. But in the meantime, um, again, I mentioned my name is Jason Diamond. You're free to email me after we're done here if you have any follow-up questions. Um, I work for Development or if you haven't done any training with us before. Um, I assume most of us have. Uh, here's what it look like. I'm for this webinar, we're going to be talking about booting up our apps with Bootstrap CSS framework. So uh, let's start doing that. Now, what I want to go over this or during the course of this hour is um, downloading and installing Bootstrap. And for most of us, I'm assuming a lot of us are .NET developers, uh, we're going to use NuGet. And some nice person was was kind enough to package up Bootstrap and uh, publish it on NuGet for us. So it makes it really easy for us uh, using Visual Studio. But it's just a single CSS and a single JavaScript file. So it's pretty easy to download. Um, but I'll give us an overview of what it has to offer. We can't possibly show everything um, just because it's a rather large framework. Um, but for both the CSS and some of the JavaScript components, I'll try to, to show them off as well as what I think is one of Bootstrap's most important features is, is its grid system. Um, I want to, to make sure that I demonstrate that because Bootstrap's not just about looking good, it's also about being able to structure your, your pages for your complex apps um, in a way that makes things, I guess, look good, um, but also like have this uh, cohesive design feel to them. And they do that with their grid system, it's something a lot of designers happen to use nowadays. Um, and Bootstrap, is, Bootstrap sorry, is written with the less framework. So if you haven't seen it before, you get a little peek at it. I'll try to show how to customize some certain things um, in the Bootstrap framework and how to extend it with your own classes so that we can keep things semantic. Um, but in the meantime, let's go to the Bootstrap website. So if I already got it open, it is getbootstrap.com. Um, don't go to just bootstrap.com. It's some um, empty website that doesn't really seem to have anything on it. Um, but getbootstrap.com is the actual website that we want. And um, here on this page, this gigantic purple page, um, you can see down here in the corner that we're currently at version 3.0. This was released on Monday, so four days ago. Um, I've been using Bootstrap 3 for probably a little bit over a month. They've been, it's been on their GitHub repository and they've been pushing changes to it every day. Um, but they just didn't make, they didn't have it officially released. Uh, so I've, I've been using it a little bit and I like it a lot. Um, prior to Monday, we were all using Bootstrap 2.3.2. .2. That was the, the previous version. Um, if you use Bootstrap before, you probably use Bootstrap 2. Unfortunately, Bootstrap upgrading from two to three is not as seamless as it as you'd like it to be. Um, they made quite a few backwards incompatible changes. Uh, normally, we, we frown on that kind of thing when we're looking for projects that we want to use, but a lot of these made sense. They just added a whole lot more new features, cleaned things up a bit, and they used the jump from two to three as an excuse or an opportunity, I should say. Um, to try to tighten things up so that it doesn't get to, too unwieldy, I guess. And it's easy to learn. Uh, but there is in here, if you're curious, um, if you use Bootstrap 2, there is in the getting started section some notes on migrating from 2 to 3. And they talk about all the class names that they changed and the stuff that was added and removed. So some stuff actually disappeared and uh, they decided to stop supporting it. So. Let's talk about the general idea behind Bootstrap, and you can kind of tell from the name that it's about bootstrapping your projects or uh, getting them up and running as quickly as possible. 
but it specifically focuses on the look and feel of your application, not the functionality. Right? This is not a replacement for MVC or Web Forms or, or Rails or whatever it is that you use for your, your application your platform. Um, I'm assuming most of us using .NET, um, but it is just something that you add on top of your server-side framework. So it makes things look good. Um, most of us web developers, and I'm not pointing at anybody specifically except for myself, um, I have a very hard time making things look good. I, make, I can make them work really well, um, and I feel like I do a good job at making the, the user experience somewhat slick as far as how it feels go, but when it comes to choosing colors, and, and fonts and getting the typography right, it's just not in my skill set. So that's what we use web designers for. But we, uh, if we're lucky, we're working on a project where we can collaborate with web designers. And we can figure out uh, what we need to, to render in a way that works on different devices we're trying to support. And he'll give us a CSS file and we'll just type in his class names into our HTML, into our Razor views or our ASP.NET web forms. And things will look good. So Bootstrap is kind of like that designer that we wish we were working with, but we don't have to pay for him, and we don't actually have to wait for him to get anything done because he's already done. So we get the CSS file, and let me go ahead and download, click the download button. Um, I've already downloaded a few times, it looks like. Uh, once it is downloaded to our downloads folder, Downloads, there we are. Um, we get a Bootstrap 3.0 folder. And inside this folder, it's a little bit on the large side. Let me open it so that this is all that's visible. Uh, I thought I was in Windows. So we're going to get ourselves a, a rather large uh, archive um, of content inside it. This is basically uh, their, their repository with a bunch of extra stuff thrown inside, um, examples and whatnot. But all we really care about here is this dist folder. Dist being short for distribution, I assume. Um, and we can open it up and notice we have CSS, fonts, and JS. Each of these are nice and small. Um, so as far as, as what we need to add to our application, it's really just the contents of the dist folder. Um, and I normally try to keep them together because there are references from the CSS in here to the fonts file in here. So if you tried to move them into the same folder, you're going to have to update the CSS, and you probably don't want to do that because that'll make getting updates not as smooth as, as it should be. But try to keep the structure uh, roughly the same, but just copy this into your web application. Rename it to whatever you want. It doesn't have to be called this. I always rename it to Bootstrap. Uh, if I'm not using Visual Studio, if I'm using Visual Studio, then I'm going to let NuGet install the CSS and the fonts and the JS for me, um, which I have open right behind this. So it's just a simple file with CSS and JavaScript and font files in it. Um, but let's now that we have a, an idea of, of just how simple it is, let's just make it even easier and let NuGet install it. So I've got a, a basic MVC4 application here. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do very little that's MVC specific. I think the only thing is the layout templates. Um, but if you're doing web forms, you have master pages, and it's the same thing there, um, same concept. If you're using something else that's .NET, I'm sure you have similar concepts. Almost every framework has layout templates. Um, but I'm going to right-click my references for my projects. I just created this project um, today, so there's very little code inside it. I added one, whoops, I added one control and one empty view. Um, so it will cancel that because it's always so slow. And search for Bootstrap here in the NuGet dialog. And you'll get lots and lots of hits for Bootstrap when you search for it here in NuGet. The ones that you want are the ones that have the purple B icon. Um, I don't know the name of the, the gentleman who put this together, but um, he does not work for, for Twitter. Uh, Twitter, by the way, is the company that initially created Bootstrap. Um, but this person, um, whoever uploaded these packages to NuGet, um, he seems to be really on the ball. On Monday, when Bootstrap 3 came out, I came and checked NuGet, and version 3 was already here. So he's keeping things up to date. And he's given us three different packages to, to choose from. I will 
use the bootstrap less source later on before the hour ends. Um, but for now, let's start off with just the plain old bootstrap file. This one on top here is old, 2.3.1. So it says it was updated in June, but I don't know what he updated in June because this is a pretty old version. Um, but earlier this week, we got Bootstrap 3. So let's install it and see what happens. Bootstrap's J or JavaScript support, uh, live or half of it, requires jQuery. And so you can see jQuery being downloaded. Um, I already had jQuery installed, but it's being upgraded because I think I had an older version of jQuery. But it's now installed. We got the green check. We can close this, and we can look in our content folder to see this new Bootstrap uh, folder. Inside there, he's got uh, our main bootstrap.css, which we're going to include in our page. And notice the fonts folder is also here. Um, it did rename CSS to Bootstrap but it's still at the same relative level, so the link to the font file will still work just fine the way that he's put it here. Um, that's okay. So the JavaScript half of Bootstrap is over here in the scripts folder, and there he is right there, Bootstrap, and there's also the mid-reasons, but um, if you're using MVC, you're probably gonna be using its bundling uh, feature, and let me just point out that if we come back to NuGet and we search for Bootstrap again, um, this one right here, Bootstrap for MVC4, that seems like the obvious choice for um, adding Bootstrap to an MVC project. But honestly, it's the exact same thing as what I just did with one extra file, and that is a file that configures MVC to bundle the CSS and JS together. Uh, or not together, but in two separate bundles. Um, this thing actually depends on what I just installed. I don't know if you can see it down there, but it says twitter.bootstrap, and that is this ID up here. So they're mostly the same thing. This has one extra file that does configures a bundling for you. Um, it doesn't actually add it to your application or do anything else. Uh, you still have to do that manually. Let's launch the app so we can, the app that I have right now, so we can see that it works. Um, here comes our browser. Um, I'm using Chrome. I always use Chrome because I like its dev tools the best. Uh, maybe when I11 comes out, I'll change my mind. But so far, Chrome seems to be the best. But Bootstrap works in all modern browsers. So I don't really see anything different here. And that's because Bootstrap is not actually running in my page. I have just plain HTML, a single H2 element. I almost start adding to this, but it's just uh, it's just CSS and JavaScript. And so let's include it into our into our page. And we can do that in a really cheesy way by just dragging the CSS into this view itself. But in a real application, you would open your layout template and you would add it here. So our CSS normally goes in the head. Let's go find the CSS, which was in the content folder, Bootstrap. And there's a Bootstrap theme and a Bootstrap.css. I'll explain what the theme is in just a little bit. For now, I'm going to take CSS, um, the one with the file without the word theme in it. So I just dragged it in and I have some repaint issues right here. Okay. Um, but you just added the link with the rail style sheet for me. Now that might be enough to get this to change how it looks. So it's pretty subtle, but uh, the padding disappeared for our, our page and the font changed. Um, so nothing that obvious yet. But let's start adding some more content to our page to get this to look a little bit more uh, a little bit more professional. Um, one of the first things that you do when you use Bootstrap is you create a wrapper element for your your whole page, and that thing's job is to uh, center the content for the application so it looks good inside the browser no matter what width it is, and also to add the appropriate padding. So I'm going to add a div the class of container. And I'm putting this around the call to render body in my layout template. Why this getting this? I'm putting this inside uh, my layout template so that all my pages have this container class wrapped around them. And we'll just save and flip back to Chrome, which I apparently closed. So we'll relaunch it. Got our padding back a little bit on the side. 
a little bit on the top. And what might not be very obvious is that we now have a centered background. Let me go grab that container element. I'm using Chrome's dev tools here to dynamically modify that element just so we can do some debugging or some bag diagnosing, diagnostic do some diagnostics on our application. Um, but notice how this element with the class of container is now centered on the page. And regardless of um, the width, well, when you get too small, it does it stop loses padding, or the margin, I should say. But regardless of the width as it stays wide, it's always centered, and it kind of bounces around. Uh, but in a normal app, you're not really doing this. The, the main thing that Bootstrap provides in terms of widths of your application is that it figures out what's appropriate based on the width of the app um, and renders things in a way that uh, might be more fitting for the device that you're on, whether it be a full phone, a tablet, or you know, medium or large desktops. So it tries to be what we call responsive. And they took a mobile-first approach where they decided to try to write the framework thinking of phones, phone size devices, they're very small. I guess the original iPhone was like 320 pixels in width. So we don't have a lot going on here yet, but we've got, um, you can see that the, the body is now flush with, with uh, my browser width. So it tries to do the right thing. Um, but let's add some more uh, to this to get it to look a little bit better. Or just add some more meat to, to the example. Notice so far that all I've done is included the bootstrap.css file. I have not included any JS in JavaScript. So inside the scripts folder, there's a bootstrap.js. That part's optional. So bootstrap is mainly a CSS framework. Some of what it offers is via JavaScript, but we're not using that yet, so I'm not bothering to include the JS file. We'll, we can do that later. I'm also not including Bootstrap theme just yet. Um, before I include that, I want to show you what some content looks like without that theme. So let's go back to our actual view for the page, the one page in this application that I've created, um, where it has this H2 with the word index in it. And just to show off um, how Bootstrap can style your elements and make them look a little bit I guess non-developer looking, right? The, the standard boring black and white HTML um, style that all my prototypes look like. Um, Bootstrap is going to make them look a little bit nicer. So I've added a button to my uh, view, to my page, if, if you want to call it that. And I didn't put any CSS classes on it at all. I'm going to add another button right next to it that is going to have some CSS classes. And these are classes that the Bootstrap documentation told me about. Uh, so BTN and BTN-defaults. Um, these are classes that the uh, Twitter, I guess, developers wrote, and they decided that when they want a thing that looks like a button in their applications, they're going to put BTN on that element. And they tried to make their classes as modular and reusable as possible. So you'll often see this, this a similar looking pattern where you'll see something like button or button dash default together. It almost seems redundant, especially when you start seeing other examples like table class equals table. What is that all about? Um, well, there, or, and then you add more here. But, and I also want it to be striped and I want it to to have borders. So we see a lot of redundancy when we're using uh, a bootstrap. And it only seems that way uh, based on the names that they happen to choose to make it make these things make sense to us, make us to help us be able to remember what the classes are that we're trying to apply to our elements. Um, but they're also trying to make these things reusable in the sense that they don't just apply to, for example, buttons. I could make a, let's get rid of the table because I don't have any data for it, but I can make a uh, element that's button-ish but uses some other tag, like A. We can think of links a little bit like buttons. Yeah, they're semantically different, but the same class can apply to this A tag, and there's button default, which is a default styles for buttons. There's also button primary and button, well, let's use something more uh, interesting looking like button danger. 
Um, so render me a button that looks like it would be dangerous to press. Uh, let's see what these look like. All right, so our, our initial button with no classes on it, this is the button we all know and love from uh, working with HTML, uh, pretty ugly. And we've got the button default uh, style and then the button danger style. And these, this is a button, this is an A tag, a link, and yet they look, they both look somewhat like buttons. Um, you might be able to tell that they're doing the uh, flat design aesthetic. Um, this is something that Microsoft accidentally made popular with uh, Windows 8 and uh, Metro. Um, so it seems like after after that started getting uh, talked about, flat design started to appear everywhere. And um, in Bootstrap 3, they went flat. If you saw Bootstrap 2 before, you saw lots of gradients um, and all their buttons, and, and that's what made Bootstrap really recognizable as the way their buttons looked, in, in my opinion. Um, Bootstrap 3 has tried to turn that off and go flat. And the reason they did it was to make it easier to customize. At least that's what they claim. Um, they're not trying to be trendy, heaven forbid. Um, instead, they just took away as much as possible to make it easy to create themes for, for Bootstrap. Um, there's a rather large theme market uh, for, for themes that you can buy for amazingly low prices, like 20 bucks. Um, that sit on top of Bootstrap. The majority of them, Bootstrap, uh, let me see, Wrap and Bootstrap is, is a one site that I, I know of. Um, but the majority of these themes are written for Bootstrap 2, so if you want to use 3, um, you may have to wait for a little bit. But here's a um, wrapbootstrap.com. I have no, no relation, um, so I don't get any money from them at all, but um, they sell a lot of good, they don't sell them directly, designers use this site to sell them directly to us, um, but they've got some pretty good bootstrap based themes that you can purchase for. I can't understand how these people make a living charging so little, um, but they do, so hopefully they, they make it up in bulk sales. Uh, but there's multiple websites like this, there's this, this market for people who use bootstrap, bootstrap is amazingly popular. Um, so the theory was that in Bootstrap 3, they want to make it easier to theme to enable that, that uh, kind of marketplace. Um, so they took away all the, the default aesthetics and replaced them with this flat design stuff. But in order to give you a good-looking layout without having to pay any money, I shouldn't say layout, but a good-looking uh, theme, they gave us a sample theme with Bootstrap 3, or Bootstrap 3 um, called Bootstrap Theme. So by just including this one extra CSS file into my layout template, right after including the base framework, saving, flipping back over to my browser, and refreshing. If it's not, if it wasn't clear what just happened, our button just got a gradient, the border just got a little bit more defined. These things look a little bit more like buttons to me, so they look more clickable. Um, I see a tiny shadow. I'm not sure if that was there before or not. Um, it's really subtle what just happened, but it does look more like an actual button, and, and so I'm definitely going to want to, you're definitely going to want to use th some theme in conjunction with the core framework. So a question from Imran, is, is Bootstrap contains maximum styles and HTML control with JavaScript effects? Um, don't know what you mean by maximum styles. So. Uh, um, you may want to to try rephrasing it. Um, other question. So Bootstrap contains a lot of styles. I'm not sure what you mean by maximum. Um, let's see. Did you follow it up? Uh, yeah. So if you want to like try uh, rephrasing that again for me to to look at, then I will um, try to answer it. Um, so we got some buttons here. There's no functionality behind them. They don't do anything just yet, but that's okay. Well, we're going to pretend that we're writing an actual application. And we as developers, we're good at making apps work. And you can click on buttons, and we talk to databases and invoke web services, no problem. Um, but we're not that good at making things look good. Bootstrap is about making things look good. And you can think about it from a couple different points of view. One is that you know we're trying to get a prototype done so that we can get our eventual 
venture capital funding. Another one might be like we want our boss to be impressed, so he improve, approves the product or our project that we want to work on. Um, so, but it's it's minor stuff, but it goes a long way as far as getting people to feel confident with what it is that you're trying to produce, um, and it's easily customizable. So, it's a really good starting point um, for for you to start working on your applications. Um, how do you get IntelliSense with CSS classes? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I have, have, I mean, did we see some of that? I normally ignore IntelliSense because it so frequently doesn't work. But yeah, all the, the uh, IntelliSense or Bootstrap main classes are, are here. Um, so I can tell you what extensions I have installed. Uh, I have ReSharper. I don't have a lot. Um, but I have ReSharper. It's not listed here in this list, but ReSharper is turned on right now. Um, but I also have Web Essentials, which is a, a popular plugin for Visual Studio, which is free, made by Microsoft. Um, I don't know why it's not part of a Visual Studio, but you kind of, I think that you're going to want this no matter, even if you have uh, ReSharper. If you're doing web development, you really want Web Essentials. I don't know if he's providing the IntelliSense for me or for ReSharper. Um, ReSharper is not free. But I could turn it off. I'm not really using ReSharper. Um, so let's suspend it. So he's now gone, and we'll figure it out right away. Uh, so it must have been ReSharper who's giving me the IntelliSense for CSS. Um, so that was pretty sweet. I think I want that back. So, oh, that was the wrong uh, place to go. And we'll resume our ReSharper. So if you haven't used ReSharper, uh, I'm not going to talk about it. I will just show you where to go to get it. The company is called JetBrains.com. So it's it's not too expensive. I have my own personal license, um, but they make re this plugin for the studio. It costs like a hundred dollars. Uh, no, like two hundred dollars, I think, was for my personal license. It's probably more for companies. Okay, um, so there's a lot to to Bootstrap though. Um, as far as knowing what classes are available and uh, what to type in, if you have IntelliSense, that might make it a little bit easier. But the documentation is really good. So far, all I've shown you is this big purple screen. But they've got this getting started section, which tries to introduce things. Um, I don't spend much much time here. Instead, I spend the majority of my time in the CSS and actually mostly in the components section. The CSS and the components section are the two pages on the Bootstrap site that talk the most about what different kinds of classes are available. Just for example, here in CSS, um, we go to the buttons area, and you can see what the different kinds of buttons are they support. Uh, button primary and uh, maybe button danger are, well, they seem to be the ones that I use the most. Uh, and don't think of this button primary as being the blue button or button danger as being the red button. It's obviously what they look like, but that's changeable, right? Depending on what your your theme is, the color scheme for your site, you may or may not be using blue and red. Um, when you just think of these more semantic uh, labels for our buttons, so typical CSS stuff. Um, but notice here, while we're here on this page, that uh, there's also a button LG and SM um, and XS. Those stand for large, small, and extra small. Um, so you, you can just throw in those extra behaviors. Think of them as a little bit this way. Um, so let's put button dash small onto our a tag, and I guess I yeah I close the browser again. So now the button, the dangerous button, um, is a little bit smaller. It's not really that much smaller uh, than the one right next to it, the uh, normal size button. Um, but obviously. I, and go to XS um, or LG, whatever. Um, but look at this style about how we're adding multiple classes to a single element, and we're just adding behaviors. These, they don't create really big classes with, with Bootstrap. They try to create lots of really small classes. Um, so let's see some more components that uh, Bootstrap might, might have to offer. Um, the one that I think people recognize the most in Bootstrap is the navbar component. Um, let's go to the website and click on the component section, and then look on the 
this navigation area on the left. Go to nav bar, and what I mean by nav bar is, well, what I mean by nav bar is like this purple one up here on the top of the screen. Uh, lots of apps nowadays have these things, and you can tell that as I scroll, the bar stays fixed where it is. Um, that's an optional feature of the nav bar component that you can enable or not. Um, they have a really nice full featured example here. Instead of just copying and pasting it, let's try to build it up from scratch. It is really simple. But I want to put this inside of my layout templates because it's probably, I will probably want this to appear on all pages. So we'll just pretend that's where I want it for now. And it's going to be a div with a nav bar class on it. Inside there we have a div with a nav bar header class, I believe. These change in Bootstrap 3, so I'll probably have to go back and look at the uh, example um, if I get stuck. Uh, so but inside the navbar header, we have our company logo or, uh, or our application name um, and some, that's usually a link to the home page. Um, he's going to need a class called, I think, navbar brand. Where is it in the sense? That's, that's very useful. Uh, sometimes I, I forget how awesome Google Studio is. Um, and inside that tag, we probably want to have the name of our app or our company or whatever it is. So navbar, navbar header, and then some stuff inside there. Let's see how it looks. Uh, I built, but you don't really build CSS, so that wasn't necessary. Okay, it's it's hard to see on the white screen, but I can definitely see that. Uh, I can definitely see. I can see. I don't know if you, if you can see, but there is a a, a header here and there's a little bit of a border and a shadow. That's so hard to see. Let's make it black so we can actually see it. And there's a class we can put here called navbar inverse. And we launch our browser. Okay, cool. Um, this doesn't look that good. I can tell it's really, really small, but it's got rounded corners. And the rounded corners, like flush right with the top of the screen, does not look good. Um, if I were to put this inside the container, that might have been more appropriate. Let's try it that way. Um, we still want some padding on top. Um, and even though we, we can you know, mess with this a little bit until we get it to look the way we want it to, um, I really want it to be outside the container. So um, I want it to be flush with the top. The reason I'm pointing this out is to show more options. So there is the navbar static top uh, with class which says, hey, I want this to be flush with the top of the screen. Um, and static does not mean what you probably are thinking it means. Um, and CSS static means something different from what I think of, at least. Um, launch our browser again, and the rounded corners just disappeared. So now it fits with the top of the screen. Um, if I had a lot more content on here, and I don't, uh, I don't let's go to our view, and let's start adding some content. So some, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong editor. Um, I set the file type to HTML, yeah, whatever, and then, okay. I just wanted some filler text, so I went to a different editor to generate that, and now I've got a bunch inside of this page. Now as I scroll, well, let's make it small enough to scroll, the header goes with it, or the navbar goes with it. So static doesn't mean don't move, which is usually what I think of as static, but static means uh, the CSS form of static, which is put it where it needs to go as far as the box model is concerned in CSS and uh, I'll leave it there. But that means it moves when you scroll. If you actually wanted to be stuck where we're at here at the top of the screen, you want to use fixed and not static. So fixed is CSS way of saying don't move. And the bootstrap classes copy that. Okay, it looks exactly the same. Um, well, there's a small difference here that you may have noticed. Let me flip, switch back to our slide. That index word seems to have gone away. Well, I'll explain what happened to it. Notice how when I scroll, though, the buttons are going up. The header is not. Very nice. Um, index is hiding behind the navbar. 
We can't see it anymore. Because the nav bar is fixed, he's stuck in our viewport or a window or a tab um, on top of the normal content and he's hiding some stuff. So we probably want to go and add some padding um, to our body elements. Uh, we wouldn't do it, well, we normally do it in a separate style sheet, but I haven't made one of those yet. So let's just add a style element right here and body uh, padding top. I believe the, the margin on top is 50 pixels. So if we just add that and, sorry, get confused sometimes. Now there's 50 pixels of empty space on the top hiding behind the nav bar. So now we can see the index and whatever other header we might have had in our actual page. What do we got here? Hi, Jason. Where to add custom classes if some are not applicable? OK. Um, where to add custom classes if some are not applicable to your requirement? So I think that you mean, what is, where does Bootstrap, what if Bootstrap doesn't have what you want? Um, if that's, if that's what you mean, um, then you can do that wherever you want. If that's not what you mean, then add, throw a follow-up question in, into the, to the app. Um, but if you want to customize uh, what Bootstrap can do, you basically just write CSS the way you would normally do. Because Bootstrap is, in a sense, just CSS. Um, so you just saw me type in normal style elements. If I wanted to customize what Bootstrap did, I think I would, no, I think, I, I know is the way I do, is I make another CSS style sheet, and I include it after Bootstrap and whatever my theme is, and I just override what they had, and they can add to it as well. Um, if I want to change what they did, I'm going to have to edit the less, the, the less files, which I don't have yet, but I will get to in just a short amount of time. So you can see how we can totally customize every aspect of Bootstrap in, in just a bit. Um, the one thing about your question says if it doesn't applicable to our requirement, that makes me sound like you may want to remove things from Bootstrap. You don't really do that. You would have to go in and you'd find them and delete them, and that's not something that people do. But Bootstrap or getbootstrap.com has a customized page, and you can choose the components that you want, and you can check them. And when you're done checking them on or off, you can click the download button. We set a lot of variables here as well. Eventually, way down here at the bottom of the page, there's a download uh, button. I'm going to show you how to do this without having to go to their website. Because going to a website and typing stuff in and clicking download kind of sucks. Um, instead, we're going to do it in Visual Studio in just a bit. I'm going to add a little bit more to my nav bar so we can just get a bit more of a feel of, of how Bootstrap works. Uh, so right now, my nav bar is pretty boring. He's got um, my my app name instead. I may want to have some sort of uh, list of links here inside my nav bar, and I can do that with uh, I guess normal LIs, and we'll have a, we'll go to link one and link two, link three. So nav is a class from Bootstrap. And it's supposed to render a list of links without the bullets. Um, and it did that, except it made my, my uh, map are way too big. So we didn't want that to happen. Although it kind of makes sense once we see what I typed in and what we ended up with. So the nav bar component has an optional class that you can put on navs inside it called, look at this awesome name, Navbar nav. And what we're saying here is that I want a nav inside a nav bar, but I want it to look like it belongs. So let's save and switch back to the browser and refresh. And notice how the, the nav became uh, horizontal instead of vertical with the addition of that one class. And it changed the style too so that it fits more with what we probably make our, or would probably want our header to look like. So they're not blue. And I don't remember if the underlines were there before. Um, but now they look like they fit here. Um, one of the problems with with uh, with uh, the way that um, I just stuck the nav inside the nav bar is that if I make my screen really small, it has no choice but to collapse. Which, if we're on a phone size device, that kind of sucks. 
Um, we, we need to help Bootstrap realize what content is collapsible and what content is not. Um, and to do that, with a navbar component, we're typically sticking our collapsible content in a second uh, element with the class of navbar collapse. And so we paste our actual nav, our list of links, into that second element. Save and reopen our browser. And it looks the same, but as I shrink, oh, that looks kind of cool. There's a, a nice looking bevel here. Um, but it's still like, very expanded, and that may not be what I want. I, I want it to actually be collapsed when the screen is too small. So for that reason, Bootstrap says, oh, we'll just add the, the class collapse. Um, and this is the class that they use to indicate that something should be hidden when it doesn't fit on the current device's screen. Okay, so we add that. And it looks the same as before, but we make our screen smaller and smaller, and then stuff just goes away. And that is nice. That where we can support large desktops, we can support smaller phone size devices, but the guys on the phone have no way to click around now. Right? They've lost the ability to navigate through the application because we hid this content from them. When you're making sites that are supposed to be responsive and work well on both you know, phone size and desktop size devices, you run into this quite a bit and you got to think about how you're going to present the content in different ways. Bootstrap helps a lot in that common patterns like a list of links in your, in your nav bar at the top of your application. Uh, those things are handled pretty consistently in a lot of apps. Uh, and the, out of the, or Bootstrap just comes out of the box with support for that. And we can add a button to our page, or our nav bar, I should say, and let's, let's call it toggle. This will open and close this collapse right here, this uh, nav bar collapse that has our links in it. So let's just throw it there on the, the screen at first, see what it looks like. We'll, we'll take uh, small steps. Ooh, it's the ugly default button. Uh, we don't want that. So we can start adding classes like a button and button default or button primary or whatever it is that we want. Uh, but because it's so common, there is a navbar common uh, dash toggle class that Bootstrap includes. That's basically a combination of button and I think button default or button primary. And also it pulls the button all the way to the right side of the screen uh, to be, I guess, right justified. So we can see that um, our button's not there at all. It almost looks like it, it was removed. And it was. It was removed by Bootstrap CSS. Because my screen is wide enough to show all the content it needs to show, it's kind of pointless to have a toggle button over here. If, however, the screen gets small enough to hide that content, uh, it's hard to see because of the uh, color of the, the text inside it, but it says toggle right now. And there's a, a button right there. Um, make it big again, and that button just disappeared. Let's make that button be a little bit more uh, readable. You normally wouldn't have just raw text in there. Uh, I saw in the Bootstrap examples that they have a, a class called, I think it was Icon Bar. Uh, I might have to check. But it basically draws a horizontal line. And if we have three of them, we've got three lines on top of each other, and now this looks like the common button icon that you see nowadays to open a menu. And in fact, there's one right there in Chrome. Um, so this is the one that opens Chrome's menu, and here's the one that now opens my menu, except I just click on it and it doesn't work. Um, so we're going to get that to work. Um, this, this menu right here with the three lines on top of each other, I've heard is referred to, I've heard it referred to as a hamburger menu. I think it's because there's a bun, a piece of meat, and another bun uh, at the bottom. So if somebody says click the hamburger menu, they mean this one right here. Um, I didn't know that until, until recently. So why doesn't my hamburger uh, button work? Why isn't it totally open this list of links? Well, because this is some interactive behavior that's going to require JavaScript. And I did not include or write any JavaScript into my page 
uh, Bootstrap wrote some JavaScript for us, which is often nice of them. I just have to include it in my page somewhere. And here it is, bootstrap.js. Um, because Bootstrap requires jQuery, has a dependency on jQuery, we have to drag this into our page after we include jQuery. So here's the uh, line of uh, code, I guess, um, that NBC4 uses to include jQuery into the page via a minified uh, bundle. Um, and you can do the same thing with Bootstrap, but I'm not bothering because that's not really necessary. I'm just going to include the JavaScript file after jQuery, and I should be see, I should see different behavior. So we got the JavaScript in the page. Let's test it out. And oh, it still doesn't work yet. Uh, Bootstrap's JavaScript needs to know when you click on a button, what should it toggle open or closed. Um, and to do that, we have to write JavaScript, and we have to handle a click event. And then when we get the click event um, triggered, we would then find this element right here and hide it or show it. But this is such a common task that Bootstrap tries to make it easy for us. And they try to make it easy for us by not requiring us to write JavaScript for a lot of their components. If we flip back to the Bootstrap documentation and go to the JavaScript section, Notice how at the very top of the file, that they talk about using data attributes and their programmatic API. So there's different um, ways in which you can use their, their JavaScript enabled behaviors. Um, each one of them has a different um, attribute name. So for what I want to do right now, I want something like this, data-toggle equals collapse. The data-toggle attribute is specific to Bootstrap. It tells uh, Bootstrap that this A tag, in the example we're looking at right now, is special. And that when it gets clicked, it should toggle the collapsing of the current element open and closed. And then I don't have to write any JavaScript to make that happen. So I'm going to do something very similar with what I've got right here with my navbar toggle button. So I'm going to add the data-toggle attribute, which is something specific to Bootstrap, and tell it to run the collapse behavior whenever this button is clicked. Now unlike the example we just saw, the thing that we're toggling open and closed is not the current button. So I have to tell Bootstrap's plugin what the actual thing is that I want him to open and close. And I do that with the data target attribute. Again, this, these data dash attributes mean nothing to the browser. They only work when bootstrap.js sorry, bootstrap.js is included into the page. So the value of the data target attribute needs to be the thing that I want to open and close, which is this thing down here. And to make this easy, I'll just give this an ID. So this is my list of links. And we'll pretend like we're doing jQuery or CSS. And you pound links is the element I want to open and close. And that's going to be what ties this button and this uh, div right here together. So let's make sure I can save and reopen our browser. Our button is visible because the screen is too uh, narrow. We click it, and now they're appearing. Sweet, and they're popping over the content, which is uh, probably what we want. Nowadays, everybody wants the, uh, the thing that Facebook does, where you click the, the hamburger, and it slides in from the left or the right. Um, Bootstrap doesn't have that feature built in. Um, if you're curious, by the way, if you want to do that in an HTML app, Google for snap.js. Uh, I, I found this plugin. I shouldn't call it a plugin, but a JavaScript library a few uh, weeks ago. And, and was really surprised at, at how smooth it was. They did a really good job at emulating that behavior. So uh, snap.js is what you use. So I won't bother showing you now. But let's close some tabs. We've got too many open. So I hope this isn't too overwhelming just yet. There's a lot of stuff that you just have to know. Um, IntelliSense can help, but IntelliSense is going to help with these. This is specific to uh, the Bootstrap JavaScript that we included. But the documentation is really good. So enough examples here for you to be able to get most of what you want done. 
for what I just did, I was working on a nav bar. Um, let's go to the nav bar area and notice how he has in here, there's the uh, nav bar toggle, get a toggle, get a target, and instead of an ID, you can collapse with a dot character. Uh, and then here is the actual thing that's getting collapsed, open, and closed with that specific class. So this thing references that thing right there. Um, so really good examples. Um, this one's a little bit more richer because it's got drop-down menus and uh, horizontal form inside it, and another drop-down menu. Um, but you can customize these and make it as complex or as simple as, as you like. Um, Bootstrap helps a lot. I'm a little bit low on time, so I'm not going to type this in. Um, but with stuff like forms and tables, just to make them look good. Um, the markup that's required for forms is a little bit on the annoying side. Um, how verbose it is, you've got to have a, a div class equals form group. This is a group of your label and your actual control. Um, the label is supposed to have a uh, class, and the docs aren't showing this, but it's supposed to have a class called uh, control-label, and then the actual control has form-control. Um, so there are certain things that that uh, they just have to know about, but once you do know about them, you get these nice full width um, elements, and depending on the size of the screen or the device you're on, they, they do the appropriate thing. If you want it to be not a vertical form, but a horizontal form, you just add form horizontal to your form element instead of just plain form. Um, and then you, it just looks different, but it's this exact same markup as it was before. So I want to talk about the grid system, though, and then, and then less. That's about all the time. Well, we don't even have enough time for that, but we'll, we'll do it anyway. We'll go a little bit long. So the grid system in uh, CSS, uh, sorry, in Bootstrap CSS. So what I've done is really simple stuff so far. I threw a couple of buttons on the page, which were uh, really ugly. Um, but they were, s well, what did the buttons look like? They were horizontally stacked. Um, because buttons are inline level elements, and that's what buttons do. Um, but what if I wanted to have some sort of uh, structure to this? I wanted three columns. I wanted a button in each one of the columns. Um, Bootstrap grid system allows us to do this kind of uh, layout without tables. And I don't want to talk about the big debate between tables and, and CSS um, and how you should or should not be doing your, your layouts. Um, in my opinion, the CSS guys won and the table guys lost. But tables are still so easy. I see, I see lots of developers doing them. Bootstrap makes it almost as easy as tables. So the main thing that you need to do is create a div with a class of row. So think of Bootstrap's grid system as being a single row table. Uh, so with this new row class, I've now defined or told Bootstrap that the things inside here are going to be laid out horizontally across the screen, and I'm going to tell it exactly how to lay those things out, not just stack them as close to each other as possible. So if you think a little bit like uh, tables, so a table would have a TR, and inside the TR there would be uh, multiple TDs, something along those lines. Uh, um, rows are kind of similar, so this div class equals row is like my TR element. Now I'm going to have three TD style things inside the row. Um, and we're going to do that with more divs um, with a class of call dash, um, let's do it with a MD dash. We've got three things and we have 12 columns to work with, so we're going to make them four columns each. And I'm going to move my content into each one of these. So call medium four is what I just typed in here. Row and call mean for are from Bootstrap, and you have to know which uh, which size grid you want. There's four grids in Bootstrap three, I, I believe, uh, four or five, um, and I'm choosing the medium one, and we'll see what it looks like when we do that. But I'm going to need to do the same thing for all of my content. Another one here, and then don't forget our closing tags. And um, he's indenting them. Why do you, oh, I guess that's why. Okay, let's get rid of our table because that was just so that we can use it as an analogy. Uh, but now I, I basically said I want this cell, if you think of it that way, to be four columns wide. Kind of like the call span attribute on cells. 
see how it looks, and then we'll check out this question. Uh, okay, they're stacked vertically on top of each other. That's how I wanted. Well, I told you the medium grid, and medium grids are require a certain width. And if you don't have them, you switch to vertical stacking. If I'm on a phone, I'm going to see my buttons stacked vertically on top of each other. If I'm on a device that's bigger than a phone, maybe it's tablet or I guess medium is for uh, desktop sized devices. Once I get big enough, then it starts using the uh, full width um, and spreads them out. The size of the buttons is varying, and that's making it look a little bit uh, ugly. So let's throw an extra class on the buttons, uh, button block, which says use the full width. Uh, button block. Um, how about for this one right here? Instead of button block, we'll do a text center. Just try out some different options. Uh, and reopen the browser. So these two buttons are now full column width. This one is centered in its column. Uh, we have lots of control. Do we need to plan the layout considering bootstrap structure, or can we have any complex layout? You can have any complex layout. It's a really good question. In Bootstrap's grid system, your rows can be nested. So based purely on that feature, you can have really complex nested rows inside rows, um, basically grids inside grids, and do what you need to do. The grid system is always proportional or fluid, and so it's based on percentages. And no matter what the sizes of your device, they will expand and contract until they get too small, in which case they just fall down. And this one is getting small pretty quickly because they chose a medium grid. But if we were to go back to the um, bootstrap documentation and go to the CSS section, and in the grid, si grid system section, um, it has lots of examples on, on how we can use these and the different size grids. Um, I just use the medium grid, which requires a width of 970 pixels or higher. Uh, the XS grid, the extra small grid, will maintain its horizontal cells no matter what size the device is. So if you want a grid on a phone size device, sorry, using the wrong tab, um, change your MDs into XSs, extra small. and reopen the browser. We've got our grid, and no matter how small I get, it stays as a three column grid. Or it tries, it's doing its best. Um, this is probably around the size of a, a 320 pixels or so. So it still tries to maintain this grid. But the idea is that you can decide, based on the devices that you're supporting, whether the content should be laid out vertically or horizontally, um, and if we can't lay it out horizontally, we just fall back to stacking it on top of each other. And if you use Bootstrap 2, we had a grid system there as well. It used different class names. There's only one grid. In Bootstrap 3, there's uh, four grids. The extra small, the small, the medium, and the large. Basically, in Bootstrap 2, you have the small grid, I believe. And if you had a... Um, uh, you use different class names, but you didn't have the others. In Bootstrap 3, you can control when your grids fall apart and they just stack. Um, but they're always based on 12 columns, um, and they have a fixed amount of space in between them that you may or may not like. Um, there's something that's really bothering me about what we're typing in here. Um, and you probably, you may recall all the debates that we had in the past, if you've been doing web development for a long time, about how HTML is for your, your structure, your con the structure of your content, and CSS is for the presentation. And they always told us, never make CSS classes that have the name blue, for example, that applied the color blue to something. Um, instead, do something more along the lines of danger. Right? It's, it means something very semantic. It means don't click me unless you know what you're doing. Therefore, we, we may decide to render it as a red button, which Bootstrap's default theme is doing, um, but that's not important to what it represents. But having to throw row and call classes in here and, and text center and button block, there's no way you can argue that these things are, are semantic class names, in my opinion. So it's almost like Bootstrap is saying, oh, we don't care about all those best practices. 
Um, that's not really true. They're just doing, they're giving us the tools that we need to do what we need to do. And if we're using the CSS, we have to use their class names. If we're just making a prototype, that's okay. Who, who really cares how sloppy it is? I, I, don't really, I don't really mean that, but if, if that's your attitude, I always care. Um, if that's your attitude, then go ahead. Do what you got to do. Make it quick and dirty. Get it done. If, however, your prototype is going to become your final product, um, which it often does, then you may want to take a little bit more effort into keeping things semantic and not having to dirty up your HTML with all these kind of things because, honestly, those things are, are uh, not, not that cool in my opinion. So let's see how we can customize Bootstrap to get rid of those but still use the features that Bootstrap has or offers. A Bootstrap is a less based framework. Less is a, let's use this browser, is a language that looks a little bit like CSS. Uh, it looks a lot like CSS, but it's got some extra stuff in it. So it's got variables, it's got mix-ins, it's got math, so you can invoke functions. Um, so it's kind of like the language that every programmer always wished CSS was. Um, and there are other versions of this idea. Style, uh, Sass is another popular one. Stylus is another popular one in the Node world. Sass is popular in Ruby. Less seems to be the most popular um, in the .NET communities that, that I've noticed. Um, I guess it's lucky for us because Bootstrap uses less. Uh, for whatever reason, I guess that's what Twitter decided a long time ago. So if we want to modify the actual source code for Bootstrap, we have to get the less code for Bootstrap. For Bootstrap. I know that sounds funny, um, but less is a language, kind of like a CSS. So let's go find the less source code. And we're going to get that via NuGet. So a question first from um, Mr. Bashir. Um, the only conflicts I'm experiencing is paddings and margins. How to resolve this? Um, so. You're having conflicts with uh, Bootstrap's default padding and margins. Okay, so let's say that you didn't like. This, this is a good question. Um, uh, I will get to the last in just a second. Um, but let's say, let's open my browser again. And there was some default behavior that you didn't like about the padding um, of the H2, for example, that we have on the screen here. So I'm using Chrome, but all browsers have this now. Right click the elements. Mm, it's not always this easy, but. You can basically do the same thing. Right click the element and choose inspect element. And now you can see in this section right here um, all the paddings and margins that were applied to the element. And you can figure out uh, what was applied. Um, I see this has a margin top of 20 pixels. Uh, let's turn that off. And oh, now it has a bigger margin, it looks like. So I'd have to scroll down and find what the margin was set at. But these dev tools make it really easy for me to find what's going on. Uh, but let me go and modify this margin top. Let's make it uh, you know, 40 pixels or something else. Um, so you can see how to override what Bootstrap is doing. So that's just an H2 element, and we'll make his margin top be 40 pixels. Just normal CSS. When I'm doing, when I'm customizing or trying to override what Bootstrap does, I often run into issues with specificity. In this case, that didn't happen. This looks like it's got the right margin on top. Um, if we inspect it, we can see it's got 40 pixels. And my margin overrode his margin, which is what I wanted to have happen. And by, by his, I mean bootstraps. <clears throat> so um, the problem, though, happens when bootstraps CSS classes are more specific than mine. Um, and when that happens, you either have to resort to the pound important hack to say, hey, browser, I don't care what Bootstrap said. I'm more important than Bootstrap. So make it 40 pixels, even if Bootstrap had some other value. If you had a conflict, this is like one of the easiest ways to get over it. But it's kind of frowned upon. Instead, what people would rather have you do is make your selector more specific. And you can choose which is more appropriate uh, for you. I agree that it'd be a better idea to make your selectors more ex explicit. What I often end up doing is making a, uh, an ID of my app and sticking it on my body. 
And now with the presence of this ID here, this is very specific uh, to my application, right? Nobody's ever going to define this. Um, and an ID is always more specific than a plain element name or a, a class name. And now this will overwrite everything in Bootstrap, I guarantee it, uh, because of the presence of the ID. And so you just put this in your page once, and now you have a hook that you can always add your selectors that makes it more important than anything that Bootstrap wrote. So if you're having trouble modifying paddings, I would try inspecting it to figure out what Bootstrap is doing. And if you need to, pound important, not pound, bang important right here, or make, use a more sp specific selector. So, but this is just normal CSS stuff. Is Bootstrap not at all compatible with IE8? Oh, that's a really good question. I, I forgot to mention it. Bootstrap 3 is compatible with IE8 and up, they claim. Uh, Bootstrap 2 was 6 and up. Now, Bootstrap, 8, sorry, IE8 can't do the responsive thing. So when I'm here inside Visual Studio and I open my browser, and I were to resize and stuff appears and reappears dynamically, I doesn't have that feature. That's a feature of the browser called media queries. And I've just visited caniuse.com and we can type in media queries right here. Bootstrap relies on these and look at the only red on this chart. So um, I8 doesn't work. But there are hacks. There are ways to get around this. Uh, if we go to Bootstrap, sorry, getbootstrap.com, and we look at the getting started section, there is a browser support area in here. And they say they support uh, IE8. Well, they don't say the version here. But if you want IE8 support, then you have to include this other file called respond.js, which they have a link to. So if that's what you're missing right now is the ability to hide it or as you resize and things aren't, aren't stacking appropriately, then it's probably because you need to re include respond.js. This adds the um, feature of media queries to IE8. Uh, I've never actually used it, so I don't know how well it does it, but the Bootstrap docs claim that it supports it. Um, there are going to be other features that IE8 does not support, and it's telling us that right here, like rounded corners and shadows. Those appear in IE9. So if those are what you're missing, you're kind of out of luck because we can't add the rounded corners and shadows with a polyfill like Respond.js. So you're, you're going to have issues supporting IE8. If that's a requirement for your app, go back to bootstrap.com and click on Bootstrap 2 docs and download Bootstrap 2 instead. It's missing a, a lot of the new stuff in Bootstrap 3, um, but it's, well, this is actually going to help your problem. If your problem is you need the media queries or the rounded corners, you should have the same problem here. Include respond.js and uh, just forget about the rounded corners. There's nothing you can do about that. So at some point, uh, hopefully IE8 will die. Um, IE9 is, in my opinion, when IE got good. Um, and IE9 is a very respectable browser. Good support for a lot of standards. So a question from Jason. Um, have you explored Zurb Foundation? Yes, I use Zurb Foundation uh, 4, I believe. Is that the most recent version? So I used it on a project maybe four or five months ago. Um, and it was cool. I, I liked it. At the time, I used Foundation because it had multiple grids, and Bootstrap 2 did not. Bootstrap 3 does now have multiple grids, so that's not a good reason anymore. Um, my opinion of, of Foundation was that it came with less out of the box than Bootstrap does. Bootstrap has more. But Foundation seemed like they spent more um, effort making it customizable. So overriding the default styles in Foundation was a lot easier for me than Bootstrap. But in Bootstrap 3, they made the, the default styles flatter. So that might not be um, as much of an issue anymore either. So since the default style is flat, it should be easy to customize. Um, but again, to me, the biggest thing is that there's a lot of things that come with Bootstrap um, that found. Am I? No, I'm in three. That um, these things right here. Um, Foundation does have a nav bar. Um, it has a lot of the same components, but it, it doesn't have as many, especially if you look at the, the, the rich JavaScript stuff. So Bootstrap just had more, and I felt like I was missing that with Foundation. 
Um, the other main difference is that foundation uses SAS and and uh, Bootstrap uses less. Um, so that might influence which framework you choose. SAS seems to be more popular in the Ruby community. Um, and Ruby guys seem to use SAS and Foundation a lot more than Bootstrap. So it depends on, on your requirements too. Okay, but since we're talking about SAS and less, let's finish things off by just showing a quick little demo of how to customize things with, with um, the less source code for Bootstrap. So I'm not going to go to GitHub or download source code because we use Visual Studio, or I am right now. I hope you are too, and then and you're seeing some interesting stuff. But I'm going to Google or search NuGet for Bootstrap again, and the same purple B icon. Um, there's a less version of that as well. So let's install the less version of Bootstrap. Um, oh, there's a small conflict. So apparently the less version comes with the JavaScript. Uh, if you're using the less version, you probably won't be also have you probably won't also have the uh, the uh, non less version, the CSS version. So you'd probably uninstall um, this one right here. Let's not do that. And just pretend that we did. So far, I haven't changed the app at all. Uh, because I haven't changed what my layout page is including, still including bootstrap.css and bootstrap theme.css. What I just installed via NuGet is here in my content folder, there is a new, uh, well, it's the same uh, bootstrap folder. So I guess this changed in three. In bootstrap two, the NuGet package made a less folder, um, LESS, and so all these files were in there. Um, but now they're kind of all mixed together. And because of that, uh, I'll leave it how it is. But all of these less files, there's a lot of less files in here. There's only two CSS files. There was the main bootstrap.css and bootstrap theme.css. Um, bootstrap.less includes a bunch of import statements. And so the Twitter guys who wrote bootstrap wrote the framework in, I guess, a modular way and multiple files, and they just compile them all together with this one main file, bootstrap.less. Um, what you're seeing right now, by the way, in terms of the two screens, um, this is the less file, and this is the compiled CSS. Less has variables and math and a bunch of stuff that CSS doesn't have, so the browser has to use the compiled CSS. Um, and the feature that's making this dual screen up here comes from, uh, sorry, that was the wrong menu item, extensions and updates, Web Essentials 2012. So that plugin is free. You can get it from the Visual Studio extension gallery, which I think is, yeah, it's in here where I just was. Um, and then I think you have to go online and search for Web Essentials. You don't actually have to search for it because it's always at the top. It's super popular. Um, but it's it's got this feature turned on, which I actually find really annoying. Um, so I disable that feature with Web Essentials. Um, I go to my Tools Options and open the Web Essentials area, go to Less, and Show Preview Window. I always set it to False. But for the purpose of what we're doing right here, I, I turn it back on. But notice how there's also this option right here, Compile to com Generate CSS File on Save, which is set to True. Um, I tend to prefer this over compiling on build because I change the CSS, the less code, much less frequently than I build. And Bootstrap's a rather large project uh, of a lot of less files, and it takes a while to compile, so I don't want it slowing down my build. So I just have it uh, generate the CSS when, it, when I save the file. But I'm not going to modify this file. I don't want to modify what I got from NuGet. That would be bad. So instead, I'm going to add a new project or new uh, file, a less file sheet. Um, we can go to new item because you may not have that there. But um, I have it there because I have Web Essentials installed and I've used less before in the past. And it's one of my recent items. Um, but I'm going to make a uh, how about a custom bootstrap less file. Let's make it bigger. Um, 
So the, the main thing I, I'm going to do here is count or at import bootstrap slash bootstrap dot LESS. So this file that I just wrote is going to include the file that Twitter wrote, which includes all the other files Twitter wrote. And I save my file, and a few seconds later, we see a lot of CSS appear over here. Almost 6,000 lines of CSS appear from this one line uh, of less uh, on this side. Uh, but having made this mostly empty file, I can now start customizing things inside Bootstrap. So for example, um, if I want to change some of the, the, the base variables, um, there's a file called variables.less, L-E-S-S, yes. Um, and let's say I don't like um, red for my, my danger uh, color. And so we can see the variable name here is brand-danger, and it's got this cool orange-red color. I'm going to change that. So at brand-danger, and we'll make it uh, pink, something that's different. So I just saved, and we have to wait for it to recompile the CSS. Apparently I hit build accidentally. Um, but I assume now there's a pink in here. We might be able to find it um, if we search, but I'm not going to bother. Let's just open the browser. And that looks red to me. And that's because I forgot to change my includes from the original compiled CSS that came with Bootstrap or from, from uh, with the Bootstrap NuGet package, I'm going to comment those two lines of code out and then include uh, really style sheet custom. Well, actually, I should just drag this in. Uh, let's open our solution explorer and notice my custom bootstrap.less file. It looks like a folder now. It's got a little triangle carrot here. There's a bootstrap custom bootstrap.css file right next to it, or kind of inside it. It's just pretending to be inside, though. So we can drag this into our page. And this file is what Web Essentials is compiling for me. If you don't want to use Web Essentials, by the way, there are command line tools that can do this for you, too. If you want to maybe integrate it into your, your continuous integration system, um, go for it. So now that I've included this into the page, uh, let's launch our browser again. And hey, there's some pink. Um, it looks like we lost our theme. Also, we, we don't have a gradients on our buttons. Um, so, it's, so they look, they look they're too flat to me. I, I don't like the uh, super flat. Like I want to see a little bit of uh, uh, gradients in my stuff. So let's import um, bootstrap, I think it's theme.les. And then wait for it to recompile. We should see more stuff appear here. There's almost 6,000 lines of code currently. And then with the additional file, it gets bigger. So now there's over 6,000. And this is all the gradients and, and whatnot that come with the default uh, bootstrap theme. So yeah, now I got a pink gradient. OK, looking good again. Now, I started to complain a bit about the semantic, the unsemantic classes that were starting to appear in my HTML. Uh, this kind of stuff. Really ugly, right? Uh, I shouldn't say ugly, but um, it just goes against what we're, we're trained to, to, to like. So I just commented that out. I'm going to keep it there so we can compare it to what I'm about to create. Um, Class names like row and call xs4, um, not really feeling it. Let's do some sort of like toolbar. Uh, how about my toolbar? I'm just making up a class name. You can tell by the squigglies that it doesn't exist. I no one says it's across my toolbar. And then how about for, um, instead of these call xs4 things, we do something like um, toolbar left, toolbar mid. And even these, you might be able to argue, um, aren't that semantic because I'm still saying the, the location of them. So I'm saying left and mid and right. Maybe I want to do something like, you know, um, primary and supplemental one and supplemental two. That way it's, um, 
as or presentation agnostic as possible. Maybe there's some themes where I'm going to swap the order of these two sides of, of columns or, or whatever. Um, if you think that's a possibility, then you can decide to try to be as semantic as, as, as you think is necessary. But that's uh, your call. I just want to show us how to mechanically do it. Um, notice that currently, we do not see any of the grid stuff being applied because our buttons are stacked on top of each other, which is not at all we want. These classes don't exist, so of course nothing is happening from them, and the default behavior for divs is to stack on top of each other. Let's go to our custom bootstrap class, and let's make our file, and make a new uh, my toolbar class. And inside there, we'll have a left. Oh, and, and uh, oh, it wasn't called left. It was called toolbar left, I believe and dot toolbar mid and dot toolbar right. One of the awesome features of less is that you can nest your CSS inside each other. I love this. Um, so I'm basically saying dot my toolbar space dot toolbar left. And then another dot toolbar my toolbar space dot toolbar mid. So it's getting rid of the redundant stuff for me. Um, but I want to make each one of these, well I want to make the top level one a row so I'm going to call the make row. This looks like a function, but less programmers call it a, a mixin. Um, so now my toolbar is basically an alias for the row class that we used previously. Um, I can also invoke make. Uh, we're using excess, I think, um, grids. So make excess column, and then say I want these classes right here to be four extra small columns, so never fall, never um, stack on top of each other, regardless of the size of the device. So we'll save this and generate the code, and oh, it already, uh, it must have already saved uh, in, out of habit, but we can already see that dot my toolbar got some margins, and the left and before, and left and mid and right uh, classes got a width of 33.3 repeating percent, um, which makes sense because we've got 12 columns to work with, and so four of those is a third of them. But now that we have those custom classes, we get our, our grid system behavior back again. So we can totally get back to what we're trained to do, use more semantic classes if that's what we want. Oh cool, all those squigglies went away from inside here. I, I noticed that uh, inside my custom bootstrap file, there's red squigglies here. Somebody's, somebody's confused. Um, it says undeclared mixin, but obviously it's working. So I don't know if it's ReSharper or Web Essentials, but somebody can't see this for whatever reason, and we just have to know that it does exist. I, I mean, we just saw it work, so, but I also had read about it in documentation. So when I first saw this being confused, I, I was also confused. Uh, sometimes we're smarter than our tools. Uh, when you're customizing your bootstrap, always do your custom variables and classes after you do your imports. Just don't do it before. That was confusing to me the first time I started using less. Um, but there's, it's, bootstrap's a pretty big framework, and they wrote it in a way that gives a lot of control. They wrote it to be customizable, and they wrote it to be responsive. So we get a whole lot of stuff for free. If you're going to use it, though, please either spend the time to create some sort of theme or spend the 20 bucks it costs to buy one. Um, when I first started seeing Bootstrap, um, I first encountered it a year or so ago and I started using it and I would go to a website and I see Bootstrap there, I just recognized the font and that the buttons weren't really obvious and the nav bar was really obvious. And I, I, at first I was like, oh cool, this guy's using Bootstrap too. And then I see another website, oh he's also using Bootstrap. Now I'm to the point where I'm like, oh, Bootstrap again? So put some effort into making it look unique so that it doesn't look played out. Um, with Bootstrap 3, if, you, if you're fast, you might be able to beat everybody else, and so you might look unique first um, because it does have a different feel than Bootstrap 2 did. Um, but still, you, you probably want to customize it to some degree, and you can do that. Um, what do we got here? Jason, does Bootstrap fully support jQuery? Yes, Bootstrap requires jQuery. So it's a dependency. Um, he doesn't really support it, but um, I guess you could you say it the other way around. jQuery supports Bootstrap. All of Bootstrap's uh, JavaScript plugins, uh, my mouse is being weird. Um, all of them, it's uh, JavaScript code in the scripts folder, Bootstrap.js. 
if you took a look at the code in here, you would see that they use jQuery pretty extensively, and then all of their functions are jQuery plugins. So you'll eventually see $.sn.alert here if you want to dynamically generate an alert div. Um, you definitely have to have jQuery included in the page. Here's jQuery being included, and here's Bootstrap being included. Having said that, I try to use as little JavaScript as possible. I like the language a lot, but when I'm doing presentational stuff, I definitely prefer uh, this style of wiring up the programmatic, you know, the, the interactive behavior that Bootstrap gives me with the data dash attributes. So I try to use those if for whatever reason I can't, and there's a lot of reasons why I can't um, for certain use cases, but I write JavaScript. And I'm a big fan of jQuery, so I'm using jQuery all the time, and the fact that Bootstrap is using jQuery as well makes it really easy, it made, it, made it really easy for me to learn how to use uh, the Bootstrap jQuery plugins. So that's really all that's inside this file, It's a whole bunch of jQuery plugins. So that hopefully answers your question. Yeah, fully supported. Fully required. Um, okay, so I've gone a little bit over. It's, um, well, a lot over. Um, if you can remember my name, you can keep typing more questions in while I'm here, but if you can remember my name, then you can Google for it. Um, I'm usually on the first page of Google. I'm not the first. There's some doctor with the same name as me. Um, but jdiamonddevelop.com, if you've got any questions, follow-up questions about Bootstrap, or you saw me do something um, with some tool or plug-in or, or, or a shortcut that was interesting, go ahead and, and um, ask. I'm always happy to hear about how people are using this, this stuff out in the, in the wild. Um, but Bootstrap is something that I've gotten a lot of use out of in my personal projects. Um, so hopefully it makes your apps easier to develop as well. Thanks a lot for uh, coming, and hope I see you in class or on Learning Line sometime. So check us out on develop.com, or give us an email. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>